Howdy, friends, and welcome to the Americana Station podcast. You may not recognize my voice, and that's because I'm filling in for Will in India this week. I'm Emily Smith. It's my first time hosting this show, but I hosted another podcast called The Alt Country Show for 15 years. The company I worked for recently went out of business, but hopefully that podcast will be coming back soon. I hope you'll come check it out. And you know, Will was feeling sorry for me, so he let me jump in and host here. Not really. He's really busy. He's making an album. They both have a lot going on. So I'm honored, actually, to get to host this podcast because I'm a big fan. On today's episode, I will be talking with Mercy Bell. She's been around the music scene for a long, long time, now based in Nashville. And her latest release, Golden Child, dropped on August 6th. I immediately connected to this album, especially the title track. There's a little bit of everything on this album, including a Bruce Springsteen cover. Someone who I wasn't a huge fan of growing up, I was definitely aware of, but I've come to respect so much over the past few years. So without further ado, we will get into the interview. Thanks for tuning in to Americana Station Podcast. So Emily here with Mercy Bell on the Americana Station podcast. Welcome to the show. It's nice to meet you. Hi, how are you? I am doing great. Um, Prior to this part, I was telling you, I'm just, this is my first Zoom interview. So I'm pretty excited about that. I don't know how I got away with that throughout the entire pandemic, but. It is crazy. Yeah, here we go. Um, I don't know if you know anything about me, but I used to host a podcast called The Alt Country Show. Ooh. And I guess I hosted it for 15 and a half years. Holy so girl. the company I worked for went out of business about almost two months ago. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm doing nothing right now. And Will asked me to step in and host his show. So I'm kind of stoked about it. Right on. Um, right before my company went out of business, I was actually going to do a video premiere of your track, Codeine. So I had... Oh, yeah, that's why we made the video for you. <laughs> yes, that was me. <laughs> and um, I had... As you know, we made the video just for you. Oh, my gosh. I had listened to your whole album. I loved it. And I was so Aww. excited to talk about you on that podcast. And it was literally the day before that was supposed to air that uh. I got the call that my company was no more and ah. it was over. So, um, I, Will gave me a list of artists that I could interview for this show. And I was like, yay, Mercy Bell. (laughs) So (laughs) it worked out. So anyway, um, I guess we'll start and get a little bit of background on you. Um, I have to know, is Mercy Bell your real name? Yes, uh, it is. I am a quarter Filipino. So in the Filipino culture, We were colonized by Spain, as many people don't know. Um, So we take a Spanish, um, a Spanish uh, custom, I guess, of having many names and having your mom and your dad's last name. So my full name is Maria Mercedes Burkhalter Bell. That is a lot for the average American. And when I was a baby, they were like, Mercy. Mercy is a short, a Filipino a uh, nickname for Mercedes. So it is my official name. It's been my name since I was a baby um, because my full name is at um, for Americans is pretty hard. So <laughs> it's <laughs> for- such a badass name though. I was like, what a cool name. <laughs> yeah, Maria Mercedes Burkhalter Bell. But it's like, I, it honestly, I, I'm very proud of it, but it's also like, I don't have enough time in the day to go through this spiel nine million times for a podcast. Yes. Yeah. At the bar. No. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Short and sweet. I get it. <laughs> Mercy is like a nickname. It's kind of like in the, I I do see that in the South a lot. Like people will have like um, a lot of nickname, like the same nickname over and over again for people, you know? And I'm like, oh, that, that makes, that makes sense. That's a lot like, or, you know, it's short for um, Mercedes. I but love it. I also have a really hard time when people say Mercedes and I'm like, no, I just don't even want to go there. So Understood. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was lit, but it's been there since I was little. Oh, and uh, yeah, the DMV hates me, but whatever. Yeah, <laughs> I had um, multiple middle names as well. And that was always an issue. Yeah, like I'm really I'm I love it. It's it's really fun for when I'm like traveling and I can go by other names. Nobody has any idea who I am. Uh, yeah. 
not that they know in like a famous way, but you know, when you live in a city for a long enough time, they're like, oh, you're Mercy, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that's, it is my name. Yeah. And speaking of cities, you live in Nashville now. I do. Uh, where did you start out making music though? I have, um, well, I've been in, I've been like in choirs and musical theater since I was a little kid. So like seven or eight when I was living in San Diego And then we moved to, when I was 12, we moved to Massachusetts and I kind of switched over to theater over there. And then when I was in college in mass, I started doing like garage band type things with my friends. And then I moved to New York city and was in actual bands with my friends. And then in New York, I was doing a lot of open mics and busking on the subway and songwriting and started to do shows and then it kind of just never stopped you know and then I ended up moving into Nashville in 2012 and um it's been I guess almost 10 years here so that's it's wild that's awesome yeah I um was reading a little bit about you and I have more of an indie rock background even though I (laughs) I hosted the alt country show. I only recently started getting into music in Nashville somehow. Like most of the music and bands I listened to were from New York or Seattle or North Carolina. And um, I don't know. I avoided Nashville. Like, I don't know. It wasn't intentional. It was just like my friends would tell me about this new band or that new band. And we just didn't run in the same circles. So yeah. um, And it is really circles based. And I think it's funny, like, um, it it's yeah I don't even know where my brain was going but it's absolutely circles based like yeah more you get into music yeah it, it was just like random I um Jeremy Ivy put out a record on anti records which I'm a fan of mm-hmm. and I really liked his album and then I started listening to his wife Margot Price who is pretty big but like I barely knew anything about her it's just <laughs> yeah. funny like you just you know you you listen to certain types of music. And yeah, then I started kind of exploring the Nashville indie scene more and not indie, but I guess indie country scene. Yeah. And there's just so much uniqueness there. I guess I always kind of lumped it all in with pop country in my mind oh, yeah. somehow. Absolutely. And, yeah. I mean, we like, even I did that in my brain. I didn't even know that like, this is, this was like a very rich place full of, you know, rock and Indian pop and all this stuff. Like I didn't know that when I first moved here, I just thought I was like going to go learn how to write hit songs, which I haven't done yet, but I'm not giving up. Oh, I disagree. I love (laughs) your new album so much. No, thank you. (laughs) And I think it's because you have like some of that indie background. Like I'm a lyrics person and you have so many just like clever, witty lyrics that I just love. Oh, thank you. It's got that, you know, soulful, like, old school country vibe as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I just, I love your album. Just love oh, it. Thank um, you. Thank I you. especially connected with the track golden child. I feel like the title track on the album. Um, I mean, that's like my childhood in a nutshell, you know, like <laughs> I, I still like, I'm almost 40. I feel like I'm still like not showing my parents everything that I am because like <laughs> you're I mean, lying. I'm not laughing because that's funny, but it's so true. It's, it's just a truth. It's, it's sad. I mean, and I think, you know, that's changing a little bit. I have kids of my own yeah. and I hope they don't feel that same way. I hope they tell me everything about themselves. Right. Um, but the line in there, I mean, there's a lot of fun lines like the plan B and Gatorade and <laughs> the prom king that wants to be a drag queen I feel like those are the band geek. I feel like those are all people I knew in high school. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is like all those people are actually people I know. And so like, I, 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 when I was writing the song with my co-writers, I wanted to stay away from like ideas of like, I wanted to stick to actual examples of people that we actually know in real life, but just take their name away so they can keep their anonymity, obviously. But I was like, let's go through and think about what, what we know and what we've heard from our friends that there's like their quote unquote skeleton in the closet. Although there's nothing wrong with taking plan B or being gay or a drag queen. Right. But it's like in that moment, but I'm really against um, stereotypes, uh, not in like a, like a, Oh, I'm against stereotypes. I'm like, I think they're boring artistically, but I think that when you mine people's actual lived experiences, you get much more interesting fodder for creativity and art. 
Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, and even with, you know, the, the unique lyrics in there, the one that I guess is hits the hardest is the chorus. When you say, would you even love me if you knew the wicked and the wild right. behind your golden child? I mean, that's like a gut punch. We were like, it was very cathartic and therapeutic for us. Like when we were sitting in there, we kind of immediately all bonded over our, our kind of, we were all like the good quote unquote good kids. Right. But it's like, we had all these burdens on, you know, in, inside of us, you know, and, um, uh, I'm also really big into like mental health advocacy and people feel like they have to hide their mental health, even though it's like a lot of the times you can't choose it. It's like you have, we're, we're, we are, we're, um, we have the responsibility to work on our own mental health, even though it's, you know, given to us by our neurochemicals and our history, but people feel like they have to hide it and be ashamed of it. And I'm like, y'all just, it's get it out into the sunlight. Cause everything kind of gets sanitized in the sunlight. So yeah, that was like, that song is really, I, it's probably one of the songs I'm most proud of ever. Yeah, I would yeah. be, <laughs> yeah, that was the, like, you yeah. know, it was the first one I heard and I was just like, Oh, repeat, repeat. I think I listened to it like three or four times before I even moved on to the rest of your album. So <laughs> that's fine. That's what I do. I've listened. I don't know. There's whole albums of my favorite artists where I'm like, people are like, have you heard the rest of it? I was like, I still not done listening to this one song 50 times. Yeah. That's how I am. Yeah. But I know I have listened to the whole thing now. Um, I feel like I think like <laughs> absorbing one song until you're done absorbing it is a totally, I do that. That's what I do. And that's how I write. That's how I, I people are like, Mercy, you must be a great DJ. I'm like, I'm actually the worst DJ because I want to listen to one song 90 times until I've like analyzed every single aspect of it to like have it seep into my bloodstream, you know? And I'm like, you just don't want to be in a car with me. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm the same way. We, we could hang out in the car together. <laughs> yeah. um, another song I really loved on the album was the hustle. That was one of my favorites. I just thought, <laughs> well, actually I'll go back for a minute and say that um, I know that you were talking about how these were all real characters and you're telling stories from a point of view of someone else. Was that concept, what came first, the concept or the music? Did it just start um, happening? The I think, well, every time I write a song, no matter what, um, I am basing it heavily on reality, um, whether it's my own like, lived reality or people that I've met or people that I've, I mean, that's been since my first album, I've done that. Um, but like, I just don't ever, I'm not going to like give people's names away or anything, but I always base it on lived experiences. And, but then when I had started co-writing the past year, yeah, two year time is a time is so strange right now. Yeah. When I was writing these songs, I was giving myself permission to be a little more, um, what's the word narrative as opposed to like autobiographical. Um, because I come from a really big theater history background and short story and creative writing. And I was like, that would be fun. Like to write a song, like songs that are not for me that I'm not going to sing. That's what I thought. I thought I wasn't going to sing these songs, but for other people. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of what I was going for back then. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that I'd had like a, like an album uh, a concept album until the middle of the pandemic when I was like, oh, let's do an album. And my buddy J.R. Bohannon was like, yeah, let's do the album. Um, Cause I have other songs. Like I kind of went through my portfolio of songs that I have not released. And I kind of kept out the ones that are more like autobiographical. And I just chose the ones that are of this ilk, you know, um, narrative, but real, uh, all based on real people, all based on real things that I've heard or seen. And then, um, uh, co-written and, uh, we kind of lumped them together into like this really kind of fun concept album. It was so fun. Yeah. I love it. Um, and you're a bartender, Yeah, I which I did for many years. I also was a <laughs> poker dealer and that's cool. Yeah. The, it's like, the stories you hear and the experiences and like people you might not necessarily hang out with 
if you weren't, if you didn't have that job are all kind of grouped together and like experiencing life together and the same experiences are like universal, um, which is, I think why this album resonates so much, even if it's not through your voice. Um, yeah, my original concept, and I'm really glad that I was swayed out of this, but I, I, the original concept was to call it happy hour. And it was the idea of like a bunch of regulars at a bar like cheers or something. But then my sister and JR were both like, nah, you got a golden child. It's like, that's duh. And I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right. You're right. You're right. I think that uh, your cheers type of concept does come through in a little bit. Cause that (laughs) reminded me of when I dealt poker, like we had all our regulars and they'd come in and, you know, they'd get in a fight over a hand or whatever and then make up and come back the next night and we're all friends again, you know? I don't know. Um, That's a cool story. Yeah. Um, But I was talking about before we got into that, uh, The Hustle. um, (laughs) That was one of my favorite songs. I'm not sure why. I guess because the character is just like kind of a badass. She's my Um, favorite character. Yeah. Okay. I was going to add, that was another one of my questions. Who's your favorite? This was my favorite character. She's my favorite character. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the, that song? And yeah, the, um, she's definitely based on some people I know, and I'm really careful. I don't like to give out people's like, I don't mind being like me talking about my life, but it's like, I don't talk about other people, but she, she's definitely based on a kind of an amalgamation of two or three people I know in real life who are just these badass older women who I feel like don't ever get acknowledgement in popular society it's like once you hit a certain age or weight or something people are just or like class level they're just like well you don't really exist and I'm like some of the coolest people I've ever met are these like brazen wizened ladies that just live life large you know what I mean and I was like it is there is an element of bittersweetness to it of like of like there's so much materialism and so much consumerism and all this stuff, but at the same time, human beings can make joy out of anything. You know what I mean? It's like the song is kind of about finding joy, even in the middle of the bullshit that we're all handled, you know? So we were writing it the day after a show on tour. I was on tour with Paisley Fields and we were staying with my buddy, Noah Smith, who's an awesome musician. They both are. And we were both all, we were, we had stayed up late the night before drinking whiskey and talking about like the hustle, like how we're doing this and how we, we, we go and go and go. And we don't know how it will ever, if it will ever turn out for us, you know, but you know, there's, uh, there's elements of joy in it in between the bullshit, you know, and it kind of sucks that on one hand, it sucks how much we have to be workaholics, right? Cause that's not the goal. I don't want to be a workaholic. Uh, it, it kills us all slowly, but it, it's like those little moments of joy in between. So that's kind of why it's not, it's not like, um, it's not like here nor there. It's a nuanced song, you know? Um, but uh, we had a lot of fun with it. We had a lot of fun and we, we, I love that character. She's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. That was one of my favorites too, for sure. Um, yeah. also on the album, you covered a Bruce Springsteen song. Is that someone that you are a big fan of or? Oh, I love him. I yeah. love him and I admire him so much. And I, I just, that song has always been so poignant to me. Like I I remember I used to just like drive around listening to it for like an hour on end, just when I would be sad and just like, there's just so much like it to me, it's like the, it's like the flip side of the hustle. It's like, if you were to invert the colors, it's like, here's this guy who's like doing something shady just to survive, but he's still finding some joy, like going on a date with his girl. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's, and like, if in the hustle, Jimmy and, uh, what's her face, she's like, um, if they're like having the best time, they've been together for however long they're going to go have a hot tub and roses. And it's like this Bruce Springsteen character. He's like trying to keep it alive with his girl and stuff. It's just, I just love the juxtaposition of their characters and the contrast. And like the part of me that's like loves short stories and loves 
um, creative writing and loves film and, and, and theater. Um, that's really just what I wanted to do was to like, kind of make something that, that was stories, right. Um, like, like brief stories that yeah. kind of paint a picture. And, and Bruce did that with that song. It's so vivid. It's so vivid. Yeah. It really does kind of follow the theme of your album. And then it's just a great ending to the record. I, um, I've never been like a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, but like, I'm starting to appreciate it more now that I'm getting older. It was the same thing for me with, I don't like to tell people this because I get in trouble, but Bob Dylan, like, I just never, you only can like focus on so much music and yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were just two that I never got into as much, but now I'm, I'm starting to, and I'm starting to like really appreciate their songwriting and things that. I didn't when I was younger. So yeah, I also think that you 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 appreciate things at different ages in a different way. And I think that my favorite um, my favorite example of this is like when I was little. I loved that song "Landslide," but I didn't understand it until now. Mm-hmm. In my th- right, and I'm not saying that you can't. Un- I just think that things hit you at a different. It's like you can't drink a bottle of wine until it's aged the right age. Yes. Right, so it's like I don't. I wouldn't worry. Like there's going to be artists that I discover when I'm 70, if I can live that that long, you know, but I should probably have found out about them 20 years ago, but it's, you know, what do they say in economics? It's a sunk cost. I wouldn't worry about it. Right. (laughs) I feel like I worry about it all the time, but it's always like, you know, how do you not like Bob Dylan? It's not that I don't like him. I just never appreciated it. Those people, it's like, why do you worry? Like I have more important things to spend this energy on, like writing a new song. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Really think that, yeah. People, people who spend all their time worrying about that kind of stuff. I'm like, what, man, I have a to-do <laughs> list. Like I have to call my bank and things like that. I'm not going to spend time worrying about this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, and like, speaking of writing new songs, are you working? I mean, you just put out an album. I'm not saying put out a new album tomorrow, but is there <laughs> anything that's like inspired you lately? Are you writing still? I, I do. I'm always writing. I'm always collecting. Um, a huge part of things for me is creative writing. So because lyrics are such an important part of my world and life and the creation of songs. It's like, that's a thing that I kind of have to work on every single day. I keep, I pretty much journal every day. Um, content, is that the word contemporary spirit? I don't even know what word it is. It's like <laughs> when you're doing it on the spur of the moment, it's going to come to me in like three hours. Um, contemporaneously. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, I need more coffee, but yeah, I write almost every day. And that's something I've done. It's since I was a kid. I also sing every day, just like in a terms of like vocal warmups or whatever. Um, and then the, the mixture of those two, what usually happens is that they kind of merge or collide and then a hook, I'm, I'll be driving and then a hook will start or like I'll sit down for something, a co-writing session and I'll have this like resource of hooks and phrases that are at the, uh, like at the ready, you know? So it's kind of like keeping, um, uh, for me, it's kind of like keeping all the ingredients in your kitchen so that when you want to make a recipe, it's there. That's how I write songs. So um, I love that. I also really am big on other, letting other forms of art kind of like fertilize me. So things that I have no ability to do, like I am a terrible dancer, but I love like my girlfriend and I watched the Fenty fashion show the other day and it was so good. I can't do any of that. I don't know how to dress myself and I don't know how to dance, but I love watching it and it's art. And I love what I love going to museums. I love watching film and reading literature and stuff. So it's, like for me, that's really important is to like surrender to other forms of art that I have zero ability nor desire to do, but I do want to ingest them. So like, that's big for me. And also every day that I'm at work, I like listen to people really actively. Um, and like, I kind of like the human experience just wash over me. Like there's never a moment. It's very meditative almost to kind of like let these experiences just kind of like seep into me, you know? So I'm, yeah, I'm always writing. I think I need to like, just, I have almost too much, um, what's the word? Um, 
uh, fodder almost for stuff. Yeah. You, I mean, it's obviously a gift that you have, like just, (laughs) I mean, I I think that's so cool. Like, and I also really like that, you know, you, this is your third full length album under (laughs) um, your own name. Um, Yeah. And you didn't rush the albums out. One was uh, eight. You had eight years between albums, then two years between albums. And it seems like music these days is like, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out. And that's, I mean, it's a lot for me to enjoy. I'm an albums person. So I, I can't handle like singles coming at me. I don't know why it's like, I want to hear the whole, like the body of work together and what you're talking about, about just taking the world in and writing all the time and then waiting till that, like, till it comes, till it comes out of you as a full like product or not product. I hate that word, but, um, you know, the, the end. Um, yeah. And I think there's ways of, um, I look at it kind of like working out and I'm at the gym all the time, but it's like, you can't have leg day every day. Right. So, uh, you'll, you'll burn out, you'll blow your knees out or something. So you'll rip a muscle. Uh, so it's, it's like, I enjoy collaborating with other people too, to like stretch parts of myself or other muscles, what have you, um, in ways that I don't need to be the star, you know? So if, if somebody's like, Hey, will you sing on something or like maybe come up with like a tiny line for this or that? I'll be like, yeah, sure. That's great. I don't, there's a lot of liberation and not having to be the focal of focus of attention all the time. It's just not my thing. Um, I like, I like stretching other creative boundaries, you know? And if one day I did a lot of vocal warmups during the pandemic, right? Like, cause it's like, Oh, this is a great time to, to like practice singing. Cause honestly, I would be really happy if somebody was like, yo, I'll pay you to sing a bunch of torch standards from the 50s, 60s and seventies. Right. And that I didn't write. I'd be like, that sounds like a great day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was like, if I could do community theater or something or like a regional theater thing, I'd be like, yeah, that's great. Like to me, cause singing is where I started. And so I love singing, like singing is my first love. And then creative writing was my second love. And then I was like, oh, I can mix them together. I can do it most. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really fun to like, just, just focus on one muscle group of muscles sometimes, you know? So it doesn't always have to be the exact same thing over and over again, you know? I and really, I'm a huge fan of Linda Ronstadt and she's, a, she did that. Like, if you go back and look at her discography, she's like a mariachi. Did she did a mariachi album? She studied opera. She, you know, her backing band was the Eagles. Like it's so diverse, you know, and now she can't sing anymore, which is really sad, but. Do you see yourself, um, you're saying she did a lot of different types of music. I know you started kind of more in the indie rock world and now you're in the country world do you see yourself sticking with country music or is this feel like, you know, the spot or do you, do you have other ideas or plans for the future Um, or you just kind of let it go? I kind of am a, and this is how I've been since I was a kid. And I think it's theater training. It's projects based. So it's like, um, have you ever done theater? I did. I was a theater major in college. Yeah. Yeah. So you know how it's (laughs) like, so we're going to be doing Sweeney Todd today and then Rogers and Hammerstein next. It's like completely different genres and you're yes. just like I have to learn a whole new style of dancing and singing and like it's all different and then you're gonna do freaking Godspell or something and like Sondheim is different from Schwartz or Bernstein or whatever and it's like I think of everything in terms of theater so it's like to me when I'm quote unquote country it's just like I just finished a project but it's like if I was to work in a different project the next it's still me but it's like it's like, maybe it'll be pop. Maybe it'll be folk. Maybe it'll be, it's, I really look at it in terms of theater. So I'm glad that you did theater. Cause like, I think you'll understand a lot of people are like, I don't understand. For sure. No, yeah. I, I like when artists uh, do different things, you know, um, my whole life, there'd be like albums that would come out and people would be like, Oh, it's so different than what they usually do. I don't. And I'm like, yeah, it's so different from what they yes, usually do. It's so exactly. cool. Yeah. I was always on the opposite side of those kind of things. I love that stuff. I'm interested in that. And it's really where I, and I think it's cause like, I'm mainly interested in songwriting. Um, I could, I'm not like, I love singing. I could, but I can sing in the shower till the end of my days. Uh, 
but it's songwriting to me, which is where I get a real thrill of like, Oh my God, I just wrote that. Um, and I think that a good song is genreless. It's like Dolly Parton wrote, um, what's it's uh, Whitney Houston. My brain is having another fart. I will always love you. I will always love you. And, I, and she, Dolly wrote that, but then Whitney saying like a good song is genreless. Right. So it's like, that's real. And the thing about Bob Dylan is like his songs. I personally think sounded better when other people sang them, you know, but everybody of every genre is saying them. Right. So it's like, that's, that is what I think is a good song. Carol King could write a song for herself or for Motown or whatever, you know, like I, that's re I really am a big believer in that, that you should be able to sit down and have your song be sung by like three different genres. Like you should be genreless. I think about it kind of the same way with my sexuality. It's like people are like, what's your sexuality? I was like consenting adult. I think that's about it. You know? Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't. They're like, what's your nationality and ethnicity? I was like, I'm a mix. I'm, but I don't really owe you an explanation. Right. So yes. Yeah. So it's kind of like how I feel about music. It's like, it came out that way, but it might not always be that way. You know, it's just like, just stay tuned. More shall be revealed. Yes. I love all of that because I mean, I feel the same way about all those things. It's just, I don't like, you know, putting everything into a box. So, you know, right. I would love to yeah. see you do different types of music. I can, oh, hear, I can hear your voice on like doing all sorts of different things. So I, <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I mean, I'm a fan, so I'm like, I was like oh. nervous before this. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to interview Mercy Bell. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'll, I'll, I'll take your, I'll take your drink order. I'll make you your favorite drink. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I was going to, you say you've been singing every day and that's awesome. I love to sing in the shower too, but have you been singing on stage during the pandemic? How has that been for you? No, I'm really, I take it. I've been taking COVID so seriously, maybe to my own detriment. Maybe I, I have a lot of anxiety and fear around it and I've been trying not to let it affect me too much, but, um, I I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't scared to do a lot of indoor shows. Um, there are a lot of venues that have great COVID restrictions, but especially here in the South, they're not as prevalent or, and if I was to go on tour, it's like, I feel like I don't have a good, I don't have a booking agent or anything. So I don't know how it would be really hard for me to like vet the safety of those things. So I've only played out door shows, like little, little ones, because I feel like that's really safe. Um, so it's kind of a weird limbo right now. Um, I am open to it. If somebody could like ensure COVID safety. Um, but I also, it's just, it's weird. It's like a really weird thing, you know, it's such a me? weird time. <laughs> I'm like, I go to shows all the time. That's like my whole life. And, um, right. I, I am also like you. I also have a lot of anxiety about it. <laughs> and, um, you know, so whenever I see a show that's like following all the protocols or I, most of everything I've gone to has been outdoors, but, yeah. um, I went and saw mm -hmm. Katie Kirby and Waxahachie in, oh, uh, um, Dallas this past weekend. And they did temp checks and um, you had to have your vaccine card and all that. And it was indoors, but I was still like paranoid. I'm like, I probably have COVID. I'm going, up. I'm going to spread it yeah. to people. <laughs> and, and I do want to say to people, it's like, I understand, like I've had to go to therapy over this. Like I have a lot of fear about it. Like a lot of, as some, a lot of people do. I'm one of those people. I've like paranoid. Um, but I'm totally in like, from a logical perspective, I, I am totally here for, all like the things you just mentioned, you know, or like negative COVID tests, the temp checks, or like wearing a mask while the performers are singing, things like that. And um, like, or like a handful of those things. You're right. And I know it won't be like this forever, but it has been, I felt kind of dumb, I guess, when um, everybody else is like, sending out their tour schedules and I'm like, I'm not doing it, but I'm also feel relieved that I'm not doing it. Cause I don't, I don't want to be out in the middle of some place and I don't know the COVID restrictions and I just have a lot of anxiety about it. So. Yeah. I think it would be 
I couldn't go on tour right now. Like I couldn't do that every day. I have anxiety still from going to a show this past weekend. Um, it's, and it's not so much about me. I'm so afraid of spreading it to someone else and affecting someone yeah, else. That's a big thing for me too. Cause I have a lot of people in my life who have are immunocompromised and I really just uh, like, I'm, I'm aware that like, like they don't all, even if they're vaccinated, they don't always develop the antibodies. And it's like, I think it's just very ableist of us to kind of go on living like this and forgetting people who have like compromised immune systems and stuff, you know? So it's like, and I bartend, so it's like, I'm already at such a high risk of all this. And I just, I'm like, I don't know if I want to, I just think of myself being on a stage, like gulping in air. I don't know. It's a lot of, it's a lot of anxiety. I can tell, I'm not trying to make this podcast my therapy session or anything, but like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I'm really nervous. Like it makes me really anxious. So no, I understand. I feel the yeah. same way. I mean, it'll be a while before I go to another show and it'll be, you know, I'll have to like, make sure it has all the, the protocols in yeah. place that make me feel safer, but not fully. Yeah. But. yeah. I went to a really good show recently. It was a Dia Victoria and she did like a private mm-hmm. little thing. And I felt really safe in there. Cause it was like, it was like a small group and everybody like had, they had done their little checks and everything. And it was like very intimate. And I was like, I could get down with that. Right. Like, like, and it almost makes it more intimate and stuff. I, and I went and I felt really safe going. Um, and she's awesome. Everybody check yes. her out. She's yes. really, um, that's she's a new probably, one I've started getting into recently. Yeah, I just love her. She's like, ugh, like transcendently good. Um, yeah, I'm fangirling and I don't fangirl about very many people. So, um, uh, that are here in Nashville. Um, Taylor Swift. Yes, for sure. Beyonce. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. But it's like, I have that person. Yeah. Sufjan Stevens, but like, yes. yeah, yeah. Victoria. Damn it. She's so good. Look her up y'all. Um, but I love Taylor Swift by the way. Oh yeah. Me too. I just want to throw that in there. I'm a Swift. Yeah. One of my, well, she's one of my like songwriting idols, honestly, like taught me a lot when I was Learn, trying to learn how to write a good pop song or, you know, and also like lyrics. Um, I love pop music. I listen to a lot of it. It's one of my favorite things. I just am terrible at synthesizers. So it's like, that's one reason I have not dabbled <laughs> in it enough. <laughs> yeah. I get that. Find a friend. You would yeah. write oh, great I, pop music. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm um, I, uh, I, I have a project in the works, but I also am one of those people that has too many projects and not enough time. So it's like, okay. If I can just find a way to make enough money to quit bartending, it's then I can work on this all the time, but we'll see. That's another project for another day. You are doing a lot of projects. Um, One of the things that I read that you were involved with is a new documentary called the sound of us. Um, How did you get involved with that? And can you tell us a little bit about it? I tried to find it to watch it, but I couldn't find it. Is it, coming out soon or it's um doing the film festival circuit right now yeah um, and i am unsure of the actual release date it is um i'm not man i don't as considering how many people who work in the film industry are in my life i still don't know what like happens after the film festival circuit yeah but um it did get it a special achievement at con the con film festival and it's been um, really well received. It's a beautiful film. I went in and I didn't expect it to be moving at all. I thought it was going to be kind of like, uh, I don't know, like kind of a boring documentary that I was, would be like cool to be part of, but it was exquisite. It's, 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 it's exquisite. And I don't I'm not going to give too much away, but it's like about, it follows the lives of a, of like a bunch of musicians who are really making a difference in the world. Um, and I was part of a segment about COVID basically. Um, but it, it's, it's stunning. And, um, like people who go into prisons and help prisoners write songs and like things like that. Right. Or yeah. like keep, uh, like uh music preservation and help inner city kids and stuff. And you're just, I was just like crying my mascara off by the end of it. Um, but I got involved because um, one of the line producers um, and production manager was a um, 
a fan of mine and she realized that I was in Nashville and asked if I could come in. And I was like, yeah, totally. Like they were filming in Franklin and I came down and then they said that they were looking for a song that fit the um, message of the film. And uh, they liked my song, everything changes from my second album And then the cool thing is that they went in and they re-recorded some of like the elements to make it more cinematic and more like Hollywood. And the end result is like this really cool new version of my song with my vocals on it. I re-recorded some of my vocals um, that like finishes out the film and it's pretty wild. Like I was like, this is insane. It's so cool. I don't, you can hear the song when you watch the movie or watch the trailer, like they did the re so that like the song that's going to be coming out in the movie is like, they have a gospel, they re-recorded a gospel choir. Like they re-did like all this stuff. And my song on the on my album is a lot more like acoustic, so um, it's just cool. And I'm really so proud cool. Of it. Yeah, and they did a great job. And I was like, this is like a great birthday treat. Like they sent me the final product on like near my birthday. I was like, this is a great birthday treat. Like I didn't have to do anything except re sing some stuff. So that's so I'm cool. Gonna, yeah. I love documentaries, so I'm oh, like, it's so good. It's <laughs> so good. And like, and I'm very into the. There's a you were talking about going into prisons and recording with artists. There's a record label called die Jim Crow records and that's what they do. And I'm like, eventually I'd love to volunteer with them or stuff, but I just follow and buy all their music now. I just think that's so awesome to give um, people who are incarcerated an outlet like that. Absolutely. I think so too. And like the song, well, I just, I'm trying not to give it away or spoil it, but like the song that they, they premiere of like one of those um like the incarcerated individuals is like heartbreaking and so you're just like yeah. and that's just one of the stories that they follow and it's like all like that the entire way through and you're just like what bring kleenex it's really good it's good. And it's it's uplifting so it's not just like depressing crying um it's so good it's really good and i didn't expect it to be like that at all um Cause I, they kind of were keeping a lot of it under wraps when I was on the set. I was like, what, what exactly is happening? Like they were keeping it wicked under wraps. Like I had no idea what to expect. And then they sent me this like super vague trailer. And I was like, I have no idea. Like people were trying to ask me what it was about like a year ago. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't need, I just <laughs> had this, like this 20 second trailer. And they asked me some questions and we all cried. And I was just like, okay. And then now I know, now I'm like, Oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's so I, good. everybody keep an eye out. And I'm not just saying it's because of me. Like if I was watching it and I wasn't even in it and I was like, it was on Netflix or something. I'd be like, That's incredible. Good. I'm looking forward to checking that one out. Um, yeah, I'm a documentary nerd. So this is like right up my alley, everything you've been describing. Yeah, uh, and that's, it's parts, that's only just like, that's just like one of the examples of the, of, it's so good. Get yourself a popcorn and, and enjoy. Okay. Well, I'll be looking out for that and um, I'll definitely promote it on social media as well. I guess we're, we're getting close to running out of time here, but I was going to talk to you about um, one more thing, I guess, um, being a queer artist in the country music scene and also an Asian American artist. Um, how's that been for you in Nashville? I feel like I'm in this weird bubble where those types of things are just like super accepted and indie rock yeah and i i just wonder what it's like you know for someone experiencing that in an area where that's not always the case i like to say i like to say that a like um when i lived in new york like it was yeah it was normal there's like queer asian American, like people of color making music all over the place. Um, as a songwriter, somebody who's like super into songwriting, um, I did end up seeking out like Nashville, right? Because as a Nashville or LA or pop or super like sad folk music. And I kind of do that definitely. Um, so there is an element of like, I chose this for myself, but it's also like my passion is to write songs. Right. So 
as opposed to like, I'm not a great rock and roll artist. I'm just not, it's not my thing. I'm not, it's not, it wouldn't be fun for you guys. (laughs) So, um, and again, I'm notoriously bad at synthesizers. So yep. Off to acoustic land I go. Um, but I've been here for 10 years and the indie world of East, of East Nashville and like Nash, Nashville Indian alternative has embraced me since day one, like day one, day one lightning 100 is the local indie music thing here. And like a year after I moved here, they were already playing my music, getting me on like the indie side of Nashville has been so supportive. Like I can't, like I got to have my face on a mural on the side of the basement East. Right. Like, um, the music row side has been silent. Um, and I worked on music row for like seven years. I worked for Sony ATV and I worked for a booking agency and I never got a single meeting. I never got a single, a lot of those people never came to my shows a lot of, and they knew that I was like all that world knew that I was doing this. Right. Um, and not, I'm not saying that nobody did because I would always have like coworkers from my offices come and stuff. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like the movers and the shakers, right? Like the people you try to get meetings with. So like, I definitely want, I shout out to all my coworkers from those places that would always come to my shows. There was a lot of coworkers, but I'm talking about like the execs and the record heads. Like I think I had like three people who championed me from that world. And a lot of them had already quit the industry. So it was like that it was silence. And so I, and they knew who I am because I had to email a lot of these people all the time, every single day at my job. And so they knew my name and you get to know each other in the industry doing that for like six years. Right. Um, And, and people know who I am because every single day people are like, I see your name all the time in the Nashville scene on the radio and the, you're everywhere. And your name's mercy bell. Yeah. So I know that people know who I am and the indie world, the indie world radio promoters and journalists and everybody are like, we love it. We love it. This is great. Like the, but the, 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 that world, the music row world, nothing, nothing. And again, I want to say like, th- I, I worked the booking agency I worked at did give me like a grant cause I was a good employee. Right. Like, so that the HR side of things was always on my side. And so I want to say shout out again to that, like the human level of stuff. Right. But right. like the, con- like that world, nothing, nothing. Do you ever. see it changing at all there mm-hmm. as far as that goes? I mean, Again, I feel like I'm in this bubble where I'm following, you know, country queer and the Black Opry on Twitter. And I'm seeing all these, you know, people of uh, different people than what you normally see in traditional country music coming out of Nashville that are incredible. But is are the higher ups seeing that or is that just still Um, from what I've seen from where I stand, it's it's the indie and alt world that is championing those people. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not, um, music row. Yeah. Like it's not, um, it, 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 like Jason Isbell has been having women of color, folk artists, alt, alt country artists open for him at the Ryman, for all his shows, which is incredible, but Jason is still alternative. Like he's not music row. He's indie, you know, Yeah. like not indie, but you know what I mean? He's like, not one of them. He's one of no. us. Yeah. So it's like the minute and the fact that like TJ Osborne had to come out and it was a, such a big deal. Like he's so brave and the brothers Osborne, that's great. But that's also like, um, that they're already incredibly well established. So yeah. like I'm so After. grateful for him doing that. Cause he's one of my local heroes, honestly. And every time I see him at the bar, I'm like, I want to be like, thank you, man. You know what I mean? Um, and I can't imagine how scary that was for years to have to be like, they could look what they did to the Dixie chicks or the chicks. Right. It's, yeah. it's terrifying. It's terrifying. So 
And, you know, they still are in that world where they have like token black performers. Right. So mm-hmm. I'm not here to like, I'm honestly not here to try to change that world at all. I don't care. I really, the only reason I came here in the first place was to like, I wanted a place where I could like write, learn songwriting crafts, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, and I feel like there should be a world in the world of work roots music where it doesn't have to be cisgendered white men with right. guitar who are straight, straight cisgendered white men with guitars. Yeah. So, um, cause like my hero of all time is like Patty Griffin. Right. So that's, that's what I aspire to do. Um, and in that world, whatever world she's in, it's, it's probably very okay to be me. Um, but yeah, TJ Osborne is a hero. Brothers Osborne are a hero, are heroes. I love them. Listen to their music. Casey Musgraves is a hero, but she's also like, you know, controversial right now. Right. So, (laughs) so, um, yeah. And, and the indie world of Nashville has always embraced me since day one. Music Row is ignoring me, I think. So whatever. I yeah. That. Well, I hope that changes personally. So I, w- I want more people. No, I don't know. I want more people to hear you and I want more people to recognize, <laughs> you know, how much music is out there. Like that you're, it's not just what they're putting out. So maybe the thing is to just somehow get more power than music row. I don't know how that happens. You know what, though? I have to say journalists and interviewers and people like you and the press or the media, like you guys, music journalism basically have been my champions for so long. And it's like, I feel like I have a career thanks to you guys and fans. And so as long as I have you guys, who needs the other ones? You know, You're I mean, good. I don't yeah. Want- bury myself in a grave and I would like to be able to quit bartending someday but yeah (laughs) you know like I just think that it's like you guys get the word out and you listen you guys listen to this music and then you send it off to listeners and people who genuinely love music have given me three albums like more or less the last three albums have been completely crowdfunded and then so it's like, they're my record label. Like my last, in my idea of my career, my only last turtle now is like, I would like to be able to quit bartending just so I can make more music. Like that's not even, I don't even need to be like, fuck you, Rich. You know, I just want to be like, yes. I just want to be able to like, also my, I have sciatica. So like, I'd like to quit bartending. And then I don't care if I just like make a little more money and can make you guys records, you know? And like, that's a pretty sweet life, honestly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So it's that's like the dream is just to yeah. make enough to be comfortable and be yeah. able to make music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm just so grateful for journalists and music bloggers and fans and writers and the people who have listened. And I feel rich. Like I almost, most of the days, I don't even think about the rest of corporate music world. Cause like I got you guys and it's like, it's, that's really what I care about. You know, it's like, you guys listen with like a big heart and you send it off to other people who like care about music. And like, they write me back saying it made them cry and it helped them through the death in their family. And I'm like, that's the whole reason I'm doing this in the first place. Right. And I can make this weird shit that people, some, for some reason listen to. And you guys put up with my like punk rock ethos of like packing my merch from my house and all that stuff. So it's like, I don't know. I feel like really lucky as a musician. I can, I I don't want to die, but if I was going to die tomorrow, I'd be like, I have like these like three albums that, that people, the, the, like the people made. Right. And we all made it together. And I feel really grateful for that again. Yes. I'd love to like quit bartending. Not, I love bartending, but like it's, I'm, 36 and it's hard in my body. So like, right. <laughs> it's like, I have sciatica too. I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's the main thing I like wake up today. I woke up today. I, was like, oh, I worked a 13 hour shift yesterday and I woke up today. I was like, Oh, my back, you know, like that's really mm-hmm. it. And then I'm just like, I, when we're talking right now about all these like projects I have, it's like, I'm like, that's the main reason. It's just like, I would love to be able to just like wake up, have a glass of coffee and be like, all I have to do today is like this music stuff or creative stuff or like write or do vocal warmups. Um, just like that. You know what I mean? Um, 
So that's it. Like, I don't know. It's for me, it's just like, a, I feel very grateful and satisfied and fulfilled as an artist, you know, in terms of making a living, not so much, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I went on another rant. I no, I like your rants. Um, I guess, is there anything else that you want to promote or talk about or? Um, I am just keep everybody keep listening on, you know, on, uh, the different streaming apps and, um, keep adding it. Cause that is really what has made, given me any kind of career at all is grassroots. And I know that it probably sounds really like a trope at this point of me saying it, but I, I feel like NPR or PBS. It's like, I exist because of the people. So <laughs> I do. And it's like, I, my first album because was of viewers crap. like you, viewers like you and, <laughs> and like, and journalists like you, like who give a fuck, you know, pardon my French, but no. it's like, that's really it. And I've said that to everybody since day one. It's like, I don't need all this other stuff if I have all of you guys. So, and honestly, right. it's a great it's, it's like a very satisfying artistic life. Um, but yeah, keep post, keep, keep sharing it, keep going back. And, um, I promise eventually I'll figure out how to play shows again and all of this. So <laughs> well, I'll be looking forward to it. I'm going to come see you when that Yay! happens. Um, yeah, I was very anti streaming. I'm getting behind it now. I used to say like, don't stream, buy music. Now I'm like, buy music, then go stream the shit out of it too. Yeah. So and I'm trying to figure out a way to do vinyl right now, but there's a shortage. So oh, apt. yeah. Yeah. And it's nuts. Cause like I wanted, my initial idea was to do a vinyl of this album, but then I went, when I went to go like hit up my vinyl distributor, they're like, there's a year and a half long wait. I was like, Oh, right. All right. So maybe back to the drawing board here. So I'm, I'm figuring it out. Um, I think it's just like a COVID thing with like, everything is short right now. Um, or like everything's on backlog or whatever. So. Yeah. I think it's a combo of like the resurgence of vinyl and yes. COVID and yeah. shipping. Like everything. Is yeah. A nightmare. Um, there, I, I am definitely going to make some CDs just for the hell of it. Um, there will be a vinyl someday. I don't know when someday we'll figure it out. If anybody has any leads, hit me up. I'll look out for one and uh, <laughs> tapes are making a comeback too. So. Oh, fun. That would be fun. Maybe make a cassette. Um, well, thank you for joining me today. And uh, I look Thanks forward for to example. following your career. I appreciate you letting me just talk extemporaneously. That wraps up our interview with Mercy Bell here on the Americana Station podcast. I'm Emily Smith. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I'm actually going to be back again pretty soon interviewing another artist I'm a really big fan of, Ben Stalitz. He's based in Ohio and he's got another killer new album out. So definitely go subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and you and I can hang again. Thanks again to Will and India for having me on the show. And of course, a big thanks to Mercy Bell. Totally fangirling. So stoked I got to interview her today. Looking forward to seeing you guys back here next time. So this whole world's made